Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to DEF CON 28, Blue Team Village. We are going to start this morning's workshop off with Leonard Koopman from uh, Ge uh, Greylog. Uh, he's going to be doing an introduction to the OpenStock CTF tools. Definitely worthwhile listening to. Hope everybody enjoys. I'm going to turn it over to Leonard now to, to get to the meat and potatoes of it. Thank you. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, first time I'm doing a, a talk at a uh, at a remote conference. I think we're all learning new things in this in this year. Um, I wanted to before I start with anything else. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the the organizers, not only of DefCon but um, also the organizers um, uh, of Blue Team Village, um, because I think that's just that's an amazing job they're all doing. They're doing that every year, but now this year I think it's even harder. Um, and I. I, as a speaker, and I think I was the first in the lineup here, so it, some things were new to them too. Um, I, uh, I feel like they did an absolutely fantastic job. So thanks everyone, and I hope everyone has an absolutely fantastic time at, um, um, at DEF CON and at Blue Team Village specifically. Um, so what I'm gonna do today um, is I'm gonna walk you through a very, very high level overview of what Greylock is. Um, and um, we're doing that because Greylock is also part of OpenSock. And OpenSock, the CTF of the Blue Team Village, um, you're, if you're competing in it, um, you're going to be using Greylock a lot. So I was, I was asked if I could give an introduction to it, especially, I think, for everyone, but even a little focused on the people that uh, will be using it during OpenSock. So I think this is going to be a fantastic overview. Um, if you're new to Greylock or if you haven't looked at Greylock in a while or if you're generally interested in in open source software, uh, DFIR, um, lock management, whatever. Um, I'm gonna walk you through it, like I said, very high level. Um, and very important, we're gonna have a bunch of time for Q&A and questions at the end. Um, that means that um, if you have any questions, um, we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna go through them then, and I'm gonna make sure that we leave enough time there. Um, we will also be, when I say we, I mean, uh, we Greylock people are gonna be around in the Blue Team Village uh, Discord, um, and there is a Greylock channel there under the Sponsors tab. Um, and um, we'll be around there, we're in multiple time zones, there's a, high, a good chance you're going you're gonna to meet someone from us over there. Um, I believe we have a little flag in our username or something that shows that we're part of Greylock, um, and we'll be happy to also answer any kind of questions that you might have, maybe during the, um, during the CTF or an open sock itself. Um, or maybe um, in general about Greylock. So we'll, we'll be around, we'll be happy to, um, to uh, answer any questions you have. Uh, next slide is the, uh, is the agenda. Um, I'm gonna be very careful with not moving around too much and not um, uh, 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 skipping through slides too fast. I think, I hope there's not too large of a delay between uh, what I'm saying and what you're seeing um, so that that is all in sync, but I'm gonna be careful um, that that works. If there are any issues, um, you can always uh, post in the Discord channel. There are moderators there and they can make me aware um, if there's something going, going massively wrong in any way. Um, the agenda for today, um, I only, you'll see this here on the, on the left, I think. I only have like three real slides um, because I wanna really show you Greylock as a product. Um, I wanna show you what it does. So gonna be a big focus on a live demo. Um, but gonna go over one slide just real quick about me, then one about Greylock, give you a little bit of background. Um, then we can take a quick look at the Greylock architecture. Um, not kind of in the level of detail for when you would get ready to deploy this yourself, but um, just to give you an idea of um, how the parts of Greylock are kind of coupled together so that you can, um, when you use it later, maybe a few things might make a little more sense. I just feel we should take a quick, just a minute um, at the components of um, of Greylock itself. Then, like I said, live demo. Um, we're going to focus on analysis because I think that's um, the as a user and as an analyst, that's probably the most important part for you, especially if you're part of OpenSock this year. Um, but um, we're also going to look at some differences um, if you're used to other tools. I think that could also be a really important kind of question that you might want to ask. Um, if you are used to another log management tool out there, um, maybe um, if you have questions about how Greylock compares to that from kind of a, how do I use this? Does Greylock do that? Is there another way of doing that? So you apply the knowledge that you have already um, so that you can process, so that you can um, really uh, apply this in a good way with a new product like Greylock, right? Um, and then, like I said, we're gonna have a lot of time for Q and A. Um, 
For the questions that you have, please use the channel in the Blue Team Village Discord. If you're not in that yet, it's a good moment to just quickly sign up for that. Um, go to the Blue Team Village Discord. And in Discord, you see these categories on the left in your sidebar. Um, there's one that's called the Flamingo Hotel category. Make me miss Las Vegas very much when I saw that this morning. Um, but there's the Flamingo Hotel category. And there's a channel in there that's called Text Workshop Track 1. We are here right now. We're Workshop Track 1, and that's a text channel. Um, so that's where you can post your questions. The moment we're going into the Q&A phase at the end of this, um, I'm going to go into that channel, and we can start to look at your questions and start answering them. All right? So like I said, Text Workshop Track 1. If you get lost somewhere in there after you join, like I said, there are moderators swarming that place, and they'll be, they'll be happy to help you uh, and guide you to the right channel. So just just ask anywhere, um, and you should find it. About me, just real quick, uh, Leonard Koopman. Um, my Twitter handle is at underscore Leonard, L-E-N-N-A-R-T. If you want to follow me on your own risk, um, you should definitely do that. Uh, my, my background is actually software development and architecture. Um, so I started my career as a software developer um, and also started the Greylock project in 2009 already. I, I realized with horror that it's been 11 years already. It's been 11 great years, but 11 years is a pretty long time. And I, I, I feel like it was more like, felt like it was more like three years. Um, but Greylock as an open source log management product um, started in 2009, I believe actually pretty much on the day in 2009, like in, in, in early August. Um, we, had a, we had a nice little celebration at our last, um, at our last uh, um, uh, uh, party over in, uh, over in Vegas. Um, that was fun, I think there are pictures. Um, I then started a company behind Greylock in, uh, in 2013. Um, that was after the open source project was showing some, some commercial interest uh, from people out there. So, they asked me, hey, uh, can you give me support? And I said, hey, I don't know how to write an invoice. Uh, so that was a good moment to start a company behind it. That was in 2013. Uh, I'm currently the CTO um, over here at Greylock. Um, that's really what I started as to. Um, and uh, I was born and raised in Germany. That's where my accent is coming from, if you could make it up. Um, but I am living in beautiful Houston, Texas now, which is also where uh, one of our offices is. Um, the other offices are in uh, in Germany and then also spread out across the United States. Um, I guess I have to say it, we are hiring. Um, if you want to go to greylock.org slash careers, um, there might be something that you could be interested in. Um, that's remote in Germany or the United States. But enough about me, real quick about Greylock. Um, this would be the moment at a conference or at a physical talk where I would ask who knows about Greylock and then I would see hands go up or not go up. Um, and then I could adapt this a little to, to the audience. So I'm just going to Tell you the whole story real quick. Um, it's open source log management. So you send Greylock or instruct Greylock to pull logs from somewhere. Um, it will ingest these logs, it will parse them, um, and um, it will make them available for you for searching, analysis, threat hunting, um, for uh, uh, alerting, um, and also maybe to filter some out and say, I'm actually not interested in these. Um, throw them away, route them somewhere else. Really a way to handle logs that are um, being generated in your environment. Um, the three main use cases for that are dev or ops or DevOps, um, depending on what you're doing. Um, definitely very interesting for developers to do root cause analysis, to do monitoring, to do performance monitoring. Um, maybe when they know that there's an issue on the platform that they need to research um, or that need, they need to investigate, um, they use Greylock to, to, to uh, go into the logs and figure out what exactly happened and uh, to um, to make sure that either it doesn't happen again, or to put an alert on it, or simply to resolve the issue that's that's uh, that's causing it. Same for ops. Uh, for ops, that could be um, just classic IT system ops. This could be network operations. Um, see a lot of people using it for that. Um, the fastest growing use case has been for a while now security use cases, um, which I guess you, as the audience here, is probably very aware of. Um, which basically means you're using it to keep a track record and a history of everything that is going on in your own. Um, that means you need to have a system that is able to really ingest all of your logs and to make sense of them um, and uh, keep them for long enough so you can so you can run your analysis against it. 
um, and um, it will then allow you to uh, set up pretty complex alerting um, like you would know it from some uh, SIM systems out there, for example. Um, that's a feature that came out, uh, I think, about a year or even a year and a half ago, new alerting engine um, that, that lets you help um, be a little more proactive about what's going on in your environment. But one of the other really classic use cases is you need to investigate an IP address. You need to investigate some kind of indicator of compromise. Uh, something new came out and there's a new hash. Uh, you want to make sure that that specific file has not been written anywhere in your environment in the last six months. Um, let's go in and um, let's see if that happened or not. Um, and then, of course, classic DFIR, um, incident response, um, figuring out if there was an attacker, what that attacker did, um, all of that fun stuff. Um, and of course, compliance, um, just having the locks somewhere. Um, I think that is a valid use case. Um, and for that, you need to centralize them. And I think Redlock is a, it's a really good choice for that too. Um, like I said, started in 2009, has really constantly grown since then. Um, very, very happy to have been a uh, Blue Team Village sponsor really from the beginning. Like I said, absolutely fantastic people. Um, make sure to, to watch as much of their content as you can. And next year, when we're hopefully all back in Vegas, make sure to stop by in person. It's always a lot of fun. Um, and Greylock is also part of OpenSock, the, um, the uh, CTF that runs during uh, Blue Team Village um, that has got so much positive uh, feedback over the last years. Um, also, of course, extremely happy about that. And like I said, we'll be around um, to help you with any questions uh, that comes up during, during your OpenSock participation. Um, now, during Open Soccer, during the Blue Team um, Village, no booth this year. Um, I was always happy to spend the day over there and just just chat with people, um, maybe give out some some shirts and some Greylock swag, um, because that is not happening this year. Uh, make sure you stop by the Greylock channel in the Blue Team Village Discord, um, because you, I, I hear that we will be sending out swag from there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be there to answer any of your, your questions. Um, very important um, is that OpenSock is not running the latest version of Greylock yet. They're slightly behind it for, for some very good reasons. Um, so the demo that I'm going to show you is the latest version. Um, if you see something that's slightly different, um, definitely reach out to us in the, um, in the Discord channel, and we'll be happy to give you a uh, maybe a workaround or tell you um, um, where that is or if it's simply not there and what else you could do. Um, about that, so just keep that in mind. But there's not um, there are some structural differences about where some elements are, but overall it, it's pretty much the same. And exact, especially the I'd say the, the core ideas and the core principles are of course the same because they simply haven't changed in the in the last months. Um, and then most importantly, have fun, um, stay in touch. It's open source, so if you get interested in this, just start using it, start running it yourself. Um, it's designed for that. Um, and there are many ways to install and run Greylock, uh, especially if you maybe just want to try it out really quick. Um, there are some ways to get something up and running um, really fast. There is a big community around this that can always help you out. Um, so I want to say have fun at OpenSock. I've only heard fantastic things about how much fun it is, so I'm, I'm sure you will have fun. And even if you're not participating in it, um, just download it, give it a try. It's open source. Um, that's what it's all about. So the next slide here promises a uh, live demo. Um, before we do that, though, I want to send you straight to the docs real quick um, so we can look at the, 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 the no, I find where they are. First link here, architectural considerations. And we will not be able to tell, uh, no worries. Um, but I want to show you just really quick the parts um, uh, that, that, that Greylock consists of. Um, if you ever get stuck somewhere, um, with Greylock, always go to docs.greylock.org if you feel like just looking it up yourself. Um, that is up here, docs.greylock.org. Um, that's where all of our documentation lives. Um, and if you, if you can't figure it out there because, um, because your use case might not be described in there, then like I said, reach out to us. But um, that's always a good, a good, good place to get started. Um, and I'm just using, you won't have to deal with the architecture because the open sock folks are already setting that up for you but um just so you understand it um Greylog really consists of three big parts or three and a half big parts i would say there's Greylog itself which consists of Greylog server and Greylog web interface but it's really one one system that you're running or one one executable that you're running um and it has two dependencies 
It connects to MongoDB. It does that to store some state, to store some cluster communication, to store some configuration. Um, that lives in MongoDB. And because it's really not much data, that MongoDB is really, really small in the end, actually. Most people will just run it on the same node as the, as the Greylock server. Um, and that way you can, um, uh, that way you can, you can almost forget that it's there. Uh, you can set it up in a replica set um, to make it highly available. Um, the Elasticsearch part, though, um, that's what we're using to store the messages. Um, and so that will, of course, you have to scale that properly because that gets all the load from searches and it gets, of course, all the load from, from actually writing the messages to disk. Um, and um, what happens is if you connect to the Greylock web interface, it will basically um, uh, execute API calls against the Greylock server. And it will say, hey, my user of the web interface is trying to search for these messages. And then the server says, yep, I'm going to search for them. Queries Elasticsearch, um, gets the data back, does all its funky Greylock stuff with it, sends it back to the web interface, and the web interface displays it. Um, I'm mentioning that because all the communication between the web interface and the, um, and the Greylock server is really API calls. There's nothing else happening. All it is, it's just authenticated um, HTTP REST API calls. Um, that means that you can also automate everything. Um, so if you are getting at a point where you want to write a script to look at data, for example. Um, you can always use the Greylock API. There's an API browser Greylock, and you can, you can start to write your Python scripts and start to pull that data out of Greylock and do something with it. Um, that's kind of my, my secret sauce tip for if you're working in, in, uh, in OpenSock, for sure. Um, if you're good at Python or another language, then definitely keep that in mind that you can do that. Um, but overall, Greylock server accepts the messages. You send the messages to the Greylock server. Um, use the web interface to analyze, display, configure, set up alerts, do all of that fun stuff. And then Greylock behind the scenes will do all the, the management of Elasticsearch. Uh, you can define your retention times, all of that. So if you're maybe used to the Elastic stack where you have to do a lot of stuff in, in Elasticsearch itself, um, for Greylock, you really just have to tell Greylock where the Elasticsearch is and then Greylock takes care of the rest for you. So you don't have to become an Elasticsearch expert. Um, I think that's a, that's a very important part. Um, if you want to, you can scroll down here and look at complex look like with multiple nodes, clustering, load balancer in front. Um, I think that is definitely out of scope right now for, um, for what you are, um, about to do here, or if you just want to give it a try, but be aware that this is all documented here. And then there's also, uh, another setup guide that talks you through that. So should be a good place to get started. All right. So now we're going to the real life demo part. And I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do is I am going to walk you through, uh, I made some notes here. I'm going to work you through one, two, three, four areas, really. Um, and I want to spend the most time in the search and analysis. Like I said, I think that's where, where most of your uh, time will be spent. But I just want to show you a few uh, other system, at least real quick, um, so you're aware that they are there. Um, so... I always like to start in the system area, and that is simply because I think that gives you an idea of kind of the philosophy behind Greylock itself. Um, our idea is that you should have to set up a Greylock in a config file only initially and only once. Um, basically, tell Greylock where's my MongoDB search, um, give it some data it needs for uh, to to encrypt passwords, to set up TLS on the web interface, kind of this basic setup, and then from there on, we believe that you should able to do everything from within the web interface. Um, like I said, those web interface calls are really just API calls. So if you want to use automation, you can just use curl um, to set up stuff automatically. Um, but during, I would say, after a base setup, everything is configured in, uh, in Greylock itself. And then Greylock keeps the configuration basically in MongoDB for you. Um, what that means is, I just want to give you a real quick overview. We're going to go into that very deeply. But if we look at our pipelines, for example, um, that is where all of the message processing of Greylock is happening. This is not some, some, some API call where you have to post some cryptic language to. This is not a huge YAML file or, or JSON configuration or something like that. This is all, no, here we go. Here comes my Linux syslog. And I'm going to say, I want to parse some stuff out of it. And you just basically configure Greylock here with a, with a very efficient and small um, rule language that then says, okay, everything has Linux syslog, apply this regular expression on it, extract some fields, 
Um, you'll see here on the right, this is all the functions you can execute on it. Um, you can drop a message. Um, you can check what a message looks like and then define other actions on it. You can thread Intel lookups on it. You can run a quiz lookup on it, DNS reverse lookup on it, um, run it against your own lookup tables. Um, you can check if something is in a certain subnet. Um, all of this processing happens, and this is very important. This is a very important thing that you need to understand, especially if you come from other systems. Um, all the processing happens in um, happens in uh, uh, happens um, when the message arrives in Greylock. Okay, um, that means that once a message has been written. Um, that means that that message basically becomes immutable. That means that you cannot change it afterwards. That has some positive side effects and some side effects that you might have to work around a little. Um, what that means most importantly for you, if you're coming from a system that allows you to transform data while you search, Greylock simply won't do that for you, especially not in a way that you can then further search on. Everything that's in Elasticsearch is in Elasticsearch as it is. Uh, you can't transform the messages during search time. Um, very important to keep in mind. Of course, we've built our whole web interface and the processing in a way that you can still do all the good stuff with it. Um, and it also means that we're, we're getting a huge um, usability and performance hit from that in, in a good way, as in it's much easier to use. We hear a lot of people who come from these schema on read systems who say, um, that is useful for a bunch of queries, but overall, just being sure what data you're already looking at um, and not, not having to mess with like super complex queries all the time um, is actually something that in the long term um, people really, really start to like. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, you'll see in the, in the inputs area, you'll see where all your, all your messages are coming in. Uh, we've got a whole section here for authentication. If you want to connect that to LDAP or, or an AD. Uh, we have API tokens. Um, uh, there's, there's all kinds of authentication mechanisms happening here. Um, and we also, that's the last thing I really want to touch on real quick is we have content packs. So if you want to, if you want to export any kind of configuration, um, dashboards, reports, alerts, anything like that, and insert it into a, um, into a different setup, um, you can export and import these things here using, using a feature called content packs. Uh, we got outputs. There's a whole index management here, how long. You want to keep data, then after that data has been deleted, you want to archive, you want to close it, you want to delete it. Um, all of that happens here. Um, it's, I think, for you for now, and especially if you're just getting started, um, not super relevant yet. Just be aware that Greylock has that, Greylock does that for you. So always a good idea to maybe just click around in the system area a little. The other thing I just also really want to touch um, so you know that it's there. I am honestly not sure how much of that um, can be used uh, during a CTF, but know that there is an alerting engine. Um, I have here, this is kind of my small demo setup. Um, I have an alert set up here that alerts me every time there's a high priority IDS alert coming from Greylock. Um, and I have another one, and we can actually look at those. Um, uh, I live in Southeast Texas, so we're pretty good at storms. And I live in the United States, so we're pretty good at not burying our power lines. So that combination uh, will definitely require for you to have a, uh, uh, some kind of an uninterrupted power supply. So I'm reading the logs from one of my UPSs, um, sending those into Greylog, and I'm triggering alerts to my iPhone when the power goes out because I really want to know about that because maybe if it doesn't come back up within five minutes, I'm just going to start to shut down some service remotely real quick or, or do something else. Um, so I have an alert set up here. Let me look at this first. Under event definitions, um, I have a condition set up here called UPS without external power. Click on that. Really what it does is it says when you find a message that has its status field set to OB discharge, which is the UPS reporting that it is now discharging, which means it has no power. Um, I say when that happens, I don't need aggregations. I don't need groupings. I don't need any other further rules and statistics. I just, the moment that happens, I want to be sent a message. Set this up here on notifications. I'm using Ops Genie, which is a system that um, Greylock can post these alerts to, and it will then um, send an alert on my phone. Um, I say, when that happens, send me a notification. And you can actually see here, if I go to my alerts and events, and I filter my events by UPS, 
you will see because I'm looking here at the last 360 days right now. Um, usually you will probably look at the last day or so. You'll see now a history of all the days when my um, GPS was out of power. So you see here, for example, uh, just about almost exactly a month ago, um, my UPS was without external power and it did trigger a uh, notification to my phone. I actually remember. Um, so you can set up these things. You can set up all kinds of conditions under it. You can say only send me this if there, if certain events happen in a certain order. Um, all of that is there. Also, I don't think anything for this demo today, but just something to be um, aware of and um, uh, um, know that it's there if you want to use it. Um, then we have the streams. And after that, I'm going to go into search and analysis and give you a quick overview of that. But um, we have the streams here. Um, streams are basically, think of categorization of messages when they're going into Greylog. Um, they are an important concept for Greylog because, for example, our retention settings are sitting on top of that. So if I say I want to keep my NetFlow logs for two days and my uh, domain controller logs for two months, I would route them into two different streams with a very simple rule, like this one here, for example. If the field gray log type matches exactly the value NetFlow, um, then, um, uh, 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 then route this into the stream NetFlow. Another one here would be this one. Yeah, if the message matches the regular expression filter log at the beginning of the string, um, then route it into my firewall logs. I think here's one for, yeah, this is anything that has a uh, snort process ID in it, route that into my IDS alerts. So you're basically pre-configuring or pre messages and you put all kinds of stuff on top of that. Um, like further processing, extractions, enrichments. Um, you can put access rights on top of that and say only team A is allowed to see my AD controller logs, but my um, support team is allowed to see, for example, my database debug logs or something like that. Um, same for retention times. A bunch of concepts in Greylog are streams. Um, I think for you, if you're getting started with this or using it during OpenStock, I think it's just a great way to make certain types of messages available with one click. Okay, so if I, we're now going into search and analysis. If I wanted to see all my firewall logs, I just click on the firewall stream and it opens a search page that has the stream selector here on top um, already pre-configured to only look at my firewall logs. I can select multiple here. So if I wanted to see all my firewall and all logs just do that this thing's going to update here we go and now we also got my netflow logs in it for this example though i'm only going to look at my firewall logs i'm going to take this out again every time i make a change to a query um you will see that this is um you get this little yellow icon here which means hey you haven't executed your new search yet i don't believe this is the case in the version you're going to be playing with um but if you download it fresh that's definitely going to be the case so i have to manually execute that one more time what we're looking at here is our search page. Um, so I think this is what you're gonna spend the most time. Um, so let me walk through kind of the main areas and then we can run more, uh, maybe execute a, a search query or two. And then I would say we go into Q and A um, and I will ask a moderator to let me know when we run out of time during the, during the Q and A. Uh, I think we started a little late. So um, just let me know what the best time for, uh, for you as the organizers is. But, um, you have three main areas here. You got the search query bar here on top. This is basically where you are selecting what exactly um, you want to be searching for, in which stream, what query, and also in which time range. That's always the first thing you you got to think about. Then you got a sidebar here on the left. I think the important part of this is the fields area that shows you all the fields that are in these messages. Um, so pre-parsed um, uh, uh, fields in the message. And then of course you've got the actual result set. So everything you're seeing here, everything under the is your result set. So that is actually everything that Draylog returns for your search query. So let's say I don't want to search in the last five minutes. I want to search in the last hour. Okay. Let's change, change that, execute it. Here we go. So now we're looking, uh, you saw that this, this uh, message count chart here changed. We're now looking at the whole hour. Um, and I think that we can also, I don't think that's in this one yet, um, but you can also definitely generate a widget that shows you how many messages were found in total. Uh, we can do that in just a second, actually. Um, so let's say uh, we're looking at all my firewall logs here in an hour, 
you see that we get a little bit of a spike here. Um, and this is firewall logs are always great because they have a lot of data in it. How much value you actually get out of them, so I think it's up to you. But it's a great example. And um, overall, the searches work the same for everything, no matter it's a firewall log, a uh, Windows log, a Linux log, a, a Amazon API log, anything like that. So if I click on it, you see here, this is the original message that came into Greylock. Very hard to read. If I click on it, you get the details and you get what Greylock is actually returning. Okay? So you see that Greylock here has parsed this out into some fields, like, for example, the destination address and the destination port, the header length, which interface it came in, which IP version it was, was the length of the whole, um, of the whole uh, 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 packet that was let through, which protocol it was, and you'll also see here that in this case, the action was blocked. Everything that I'm looking at here on these logs, uh, I'm only sending me the block logs. So I'm not interested in what the firewall let through. I'm only interested in what the firewall um, uh, actually blocked, okay? So with all of this, you also see source address and source port. Um, let's say we only want to see the messages from a certain source, okay? Where the source address is set to this value. What I could do is I could go into the search query bar on top here and say source underscore address equals, and then 13, 56, whatever I want to look for, okay? Much faster is to just simply click on the value. This context menu opens and you say add to query. And it will just build that for you and immediately execute. So what we're now looking at is, we're looking at all blocked packets from the last hour where this was the source address. So basically, all the packets this source address sent us are blocked. Okay, so let's try to get a little bit of a better overview here um, of um, what that looked like. So I want to find out was this all TCP or both. Do you see we have a field here called protocol? Try to get the top values. I want to see if they're all set. I see something like that. So protocol, show top values. This opens and you see that, no, actually this source only sent um, uh, UDP messages. Okay, let's go a little deeper and say, is this always the same kind of package? Are they all, do they all have the same length? Like it's very, very uniform, same thing. Data length, show top values. Here we go. We see that actually all of these packages are UDP and exactly 278 bytes long. So. That looks like we're just blocking the same package over and over and over again. Now, it would be interesting, this setup isn't doing it, but if we would run a um, who is lookup, that's a built-in lookup table onto this source address, or our geo IP to see where this is coming from, who owns this IP address, um, look up the underlying ASN, do all of that. Stuff. That's I'm simply not doing that here in this setup, um, but that's all stuff that you could do. Um, and now let's maybe say, um, I want to see, uh, no, let's actually go back. I'm gonna execute this query again. And what you're gonna see is all the data in the result set because the result set change has now updated. Now we see for the last one hour for everything that was blocked, UDP, TCP, and ICMP, okay? I'm gonna delete this widget here. I wanna show you the aggregation builder. That's really the last part I wanna show you here for the um, search query language, go to docs.graylog.org. There's a whole page that explains the whole search query language for you. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here um, because you can simply read it up there. Um, it's pretty simple. It's in the end, if you've been using the Elastic Stack, it's the same language. We're just passing it through Elastic Stack. Um, so if you're used to that, same thing. Um, so whenever Graylog creates a widget, that is under the hood, in fact, an aggregation and an aggregation build. So you will always see this little icon top right of the widget that you can click on and say edit. And now edit is going to show you the aggregation builder. Um, and it has one very important drop down box, which is the visualization type. Let's say you want to um, visualize this not as a data table, but as a bar chart and say, I really want to see three bars here with UDP the largest, TCP on second, and then a tiny one for ICMP based on the count. Okay. You switch it up, bar chart. Here we go. Save it. I could now make a dashboard out of this. Okay. Here we see for the last hour, we mostly brought uh, UDP stuff. Okay. Interesting. Um, you could, of course, if you really wanted to, make it a. I think they're much harder to read, but 
Sure, could do that. Kraylog is not going to keep you from building weird charts either. So you want to make this a long chart? Sure, not a problem. Can do that. Um, so this is our aggregation builder. You can do sorting. You can add multiple rows. We're going to do that in just one second. And you can also add metrics. So let's say I want to get the uh, total bytes that were blocked over the last one hour. Okay. So you know we got the data length field here. Click on that, press chart. That is going to create a new widget. Um, and that widget is uh, basically just the same aggregation builder, but with other predefined values. Okay, you're going to see that in one second. Chart. Here we go. So now we got the average data length by timestamp. Click on edit. See, okay, that's our line chart. That's how much data was transferred per minute in this case um, on average. But you know what? Let's make this a data table so you see what this looks like under the hood. It's like for each minute, it calculates the average data length. And with this kind of column row structure, you can put that in, in a, um, into a bar chart. You can put this into a line chart. But I think what we're really interested in here, we don't want to look at the average data length. We want to look at the sum of the data length. Here we go. That line chart. And now we see um, how many bytes were blocked in total. Um, I, I just had to know that this was called sum. If you, you can do standard deviation, max, min, count, cardinality, average, um, variance, percentile. You can do all of that stuff with it if you wanted to. Okay. One more thing I want to show you, and then we're going to go into the QA. Um, I really want to make sure that you start playing around with the aggregation building because that one is extremely powerful and will really help you solve these, these challenges that OpenSock is going to give you. Um, one more thing I want to show you is let's say we want to build an aggregate. We say grouped by source address, which um, grouped by source address, which uh, protocol was used. Okay. So let's go into the source address, get the top values of that as kind of a start, edit, and we can add multiple rows here. So let's set this to protocol. I want to add a second type of row, which is protocol. It's going to update. And you actually see here that these have all only communicated uh, with UDP or TCP. They're not really doing multiple things. So to uh, explain this a little better, let's build pairs of Source address to destination. Take the protocol out, add a new field, destination address. Here we go. So now you see, um, this is also, this is not really what I wanted to show. Let's do it the other way around. Maybe destination address to source address. Here we go. That's what I wanted. So you get this grouping where you say this destination address um, was reached by these source addresses. And you can go lower and lower and lower as you wish and add more and more stuff. So let's say as the metric, here's the third column. I actually don't want the count. I do actually want the total bytes that were transferred. So the sum of the data length. So without any kind of complex queries, established that um, this destination address was hit by this source address with this many bytes over the last hour. Okay. And I can make this a little larger, put this wherever I want. I could now save this as a dashboard, share it with colleagues. Um, there's a whole concept of parameters in there. This is all stuff I don't want to go into too deep today, um, but that's all um, stuff that you can do. And you can also really start to combine this in, in very many different ways. What I can tell you is this might be, this might look like it's a it's a pretty good learning curve associated with the with all these fields and the data table and the visualizations. Um, I would encourage you just to play around with it. The worst thing that can happen is that it shows you either a chart that doesn't make sense or that it shows you an, an error when something really doesn't compute. Okay, you can't break anything. Um, just really start to play around with this stuff. Maybe think about something you want to visualize and just see how you would approach that. Um, if you get stuck, go into Discord and um, there might be someone who can help you um, from our team. Um, and also, whenever you feel like, okay, this stops making sense, Go back to the data table and look like what underlying data we're really looking for. Um, once you have multiple dimensions, you can do stack bar charts. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff. So I would encourage you to play around with that. Um, this is really an absolute core idea of um, what Corelog does and what you could do with it. 
So with that, I would say that's my demo. Um, and as many minutes as we have left, um, I would use for Q&A. Um, and like I said, if a moderator could let me know, if we're kind of starting to run um, short on time or when it's time for me to stop. Um, I would say we're going to do five minutes. I really, I honestly hope we had a little more time. Um, uh, I'm going to do five minutes of q and A. I'm breaking my promise here a little of having time, but I'm going to promise I'm personally going to be around in that, um, in that Discord channel uh, for the next day. So everything that's, that's left after these five minutes, um, I'm just going to um, answer there. And like I said, there are a bunch of other people too. And I hear that there's swag. Um, so Linux on the desktop, I do not know how to hide and you can't see it. So I'm going to go straight into that. Um, I'm going to go straight onto this one here, and I'm going to try to find some questions, okay? Uh, Bart, uh, wanna... We have about two minutes, if you don't mind. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. we just like uh, to move the questions over to the uh, text window or the chat, I'm sorry, uh, yep. if we run out of time. Thank you. Understood. Um, so I see a few questions here. Uh, given the skim through a lot of them, but I see a question about if there is an OVA, um, there is. If you go to graylock.org and you go to get graylock, big button here. Um, these are all the ways that you can install it. Um, there's Docker images, OVA, virtual appliances. Um, we're integrating with Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, and there are Debian and RPM packages to get started really quick. Uh, and the documentation is going to guide you through um, through doing that. Okay, let me scroll down a little more here. Uh, this is available on Linux, and the best way to set up the environment is um, described in the documentation. In fact, it only runs on Linux. Um, it does not run on Windows. Um, so um, I would definitely recommend to run this on Linux. All the official, um, all of the official um, installation methods are are going to be based on Linux for sure. Uh, I'm going to pick one more, and then I'm going to stick around in the channel and also in the Greylock channel, please. Um, Let's see if I find one more. There we go. That's a good one. Is there some kind of how to for reading in a log file um, written by another application? So you have another server and there's something running on it that writes a local log file, right? How do I get these into my Greylock now? Um, there, there are several ways of doing that. Greylock has, an, has a concept called sidecar to even remotely manage of collectors. Um, that is, however, not required. You can also just use any um, kind of open source collector that's out there. Um, I personally recommend FileBeats um, or NXLog. Um, FileBeats coming from Elastic, um, they can send straight to our inputs, and you really just tell it, hey, here's a log, um, and um, please send me everything that goes into that to this Greylock system. It will buffer locally. Um, so look at FileBeat um, or at NXLog. Um, there's also winlog beat and a packet beat, and, and, and xlog is also great for reading properly. And so with that, um, I will keep my promise and stick around for more questions that are coming in. Um, follow me on Twitter if you have questions in the long term. Uh, that's at underscore Leonard, L-E-N-N-A-R-T. And I hope you enjoyed that. And I really, really hope that you have an absolutely fantastic time playing OpenSock or trying out Greylock. Um, we're building this for you, for the community in the end. And um, so let us know if anything doesn't work, if anything doesn't make sense, if you want to prove anything. It's open source. Use it, play it, improve it. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lennart. Uh, appreciate your time. A uh, great presentation. We'll look forward to hearing more from you guys.